which I attended first. Uh, the song Stagger Lee has a basis in, in reality. Uh, the lead line was one of the uh, big Mississippi River Boat lines. And uh, Mr. Lee fathered a child with one of his black employees, and that was Stagger Lee. Now, whether the rest of the story has any basis in fact, that's what it is.
so I said, maybe it's the teacher that all my mistakes got to free. He said his default state was loneliness till he learned to love. And I know I'm too busy for me. The moment we stopped needing, we realized that that need was the pain. Pain, no meaning. But without pain, no meaning. Pain sets time free to fly. There's no meeting without the fire. They tell us life is compromised. Life is not compromised. Life is the event of the day. And we die so that the event can grow into a myth. So each story has its ending. Our task is to be happy in the end. As we pointed to the street, said, this is the teacher. This is a great teacher. And the question, the question wakens us from these dreams. And the question is, where will my pain take me? Past fear. I don't like you. No, 
You're annoying. You smell bad, too. <laughs> Go away. Hey, that was like <laughs> Slide. The aluminum hot from the sun could burn your skin. 
We'd run screaming into the water, submerging our burnt buns. And the teeter-totters and swings could bruise you and chip your teeth. There was just so much you had to learn. The public school kids were there too. We didn't play with them much. They were rougher than us Catholic kids who'd been drilled that one day the meat would own the herd. I remember once coming back from the paddling pool when a Protestant boy pushed me to the ground. I scraped my leg badly and lied to my mother when she asked what had happened. I knew he did it because I was a Catholic. One day Tracy brought something to the paddling pool, probably left behind by one of the older boys at the Bend in Presbyterian Church in this kitty corner for our house. I'd never seen anything like it. It was called a Playboy. Tracy showed it to Kelly, Tyler, and me. He carefully removed it from the plastic bag to kept me from getting dirty. It was as if he had unearthed the Holy Grail. On the cover, a photograph of a beautiful half-naked girl. Tracy announced he was going to show us what a woman's kit looked like. It's a big round thing with a little brown dot in the middle, he explained, pointing to a picture of a gorgeous woman, a woman smiling and displaying her chest. I gasped. My penis became uncomfortable in my swimming trunks. I didn't make the causal connection. He spoke with the air of an old wise man, said that he'd seen them twice before in real life. Once was his mother, and the other time was a neighborhood woman nursing a child. He continued weeping through the magazine. There were pictures of other women showing their breasts, legs, and an occasional butt. And even the cartoons were like no one, like nothing had ever seen before. Naked women with torpedo-shaped kits and rolling poster-shaped asses rewarded with rich men and spies alike. Tracy finished his presentation then looked proudly at us. Our mouths were left gaping and our eyelids were heavy. Later that night, as I ate my supper, I couldn't stop the day's memories pervading my mind. And I realized I really liked looking at those forbidden pictures of naked women. Thank you. Now the pleasures of this planet aren't enough. 
I was alone back then, Young Street. As I mentioned, I'm alone right now, although I don't want to be. Should I see a psychic? I've already passed three. What will you look like in the year 2063? What robust, exhilarating joy would have been mine, despite the fact that I'm colored, if I could have strolled down you in the year 1933? If quantum theorists are right, then everyone who has ever walked down this street, and everyone who will ever walk down this street, is walking down this street holding my hand right now. The sky is a brilliant baby blue without a single cloud. The sun is rising to its zenith. My mind state is full of stubby arms reaching out of the cement, grasping for the charred skeletons of the constellations of stars. Shut the fuck up, Young Street. Jihad me at hello. That was actually the ridiculous headline that greeted me on the cover of today's paper. I'm not making this up. I am living. I have lived. I live like a deposed king and a beached whale. My glittering throat blazed like a berry of solace and a trinket of joy. Ah, Young Street, I just passed an aggressive can handler hoisting up a cardboard sign that says, need money for question mark. And I wonder how much money he'll get at the end of the day. What the hell is with all the upcoming condos? Why? Why are you dolling yourself up? like a cut-rate Times Square. It's 2015. Tis the April of our prime, and I'm just strutting down one of the world's largest streets, which just happens to be you, jotting down some of the things that catch my eye. I can't record everything, as you know. There go some sleazy dudes entering the Zanzibar. And there, over there are a few horny bitches coming out of Remington's. There. There's a group of teenagers waltzing into the Eden Center. And there, there's the beloved ghost of my retired, much pined for, greatly missed drug dealer. There's a DJ on his way to play the record as Christian and Muslim zealots bludgeon him, assorted passerbys, and people hopping off of the streetcar with their stale, dogmatic views at the same time. There's a seemingly affluent Indian couple worming out of the Elgin Theater. There, there's an undercover cop on his way to Fran's restaurant on Shooter Street, carrying a wooden armillary spear. And there, there's the musician Mark Martyr and a member of the F-14. And there, there's an Asian broad wearing an unsettling surgical mask and a scarf the size of a blanket. You get the point, man. I'm done. Sayonara. At the Java House on Queen Street West, that aforementioned sensual woman from the Mediterranean awaits me, her passionate, swarthy lover. And if she's lucky, no, if I'm lucky, we just may be here for another languid night. So farewell, Toronto. My kind shall soon be extinct. Adios, Young Street. I only wanted to see your golden hair illuminated by the light of the full moon. Cars, 
buildings, figures emerge and disappear as they walk to moments of meeting. The sun grows white as the moon, then becomes a thin rind of lemon. In the afternoon, lit by its brilliance, through windows we eat cheesecake and fresh blueberry sauce with crisp sweet I, I then ended up doing a series of 
uh, for a CD, which I have some with me. And um, from that, just being asked, I decided I'd do something different. So that's how I got into my CD. And it was from the CD that I got into film. Um, so it all just kind of happened, learning along the way, um, as we all are doing. So I'm going I'm to read one from the CD. It's called Sea, Bone, and Hammer. And it began, uh, I began that program in 2009. And worked with a wonderful composer named Lane Art, who, who uh, has since moved to Victoria, where he does lots of, uh, lots of games with people. He's a wonderful composer. Um, so I'm going to go back in time to a little house that I rented that was near the University of Alberta, where I was working. Um, it was a very it was a house from the 1920s. From the minute I stepped in, I felt it was a little different. Uh, I won't say anymore. So this one is called it's a very gentle piece. I like to begin with this one. So forgive us our trespasses. The back door opens and time blossoms in his palm. A silver bowl, a prayer. Whatever he throws out the window spins back to earth, coins over his eyes. The lids sewn shut. Whatever he throws out the window grows in the garden, where we unearth peach picks, wild dill, hazelnut shell, small piles of shining stones, blood bulbs, blossoms long ago wound, bones the shape of fingers grasping. Once the rotting carcass of a sparrow spread its song beneath the lilacs. Once we remembered to bury our promise, row upon row of forgetting, lines we couldn't keep, what we said, what he answered, what was implied. Once remembering the space opening between now and then, a sliver of light between the cracks of the back door and the kitchen wall holding its breath. Once remembered reaching to touch Grasping our fingers each for the other, looking for spring crocus, daffodils, kneeling in the garden, cupping the light, whispering a prayer. What it was to be alive, what it is to name the night, the back door choosing now or then. The sparrow asleep flutters its remembered wings and spins a dream on a dime in the dirt. We bet our last dollar, planted seeds, row upon row of knowing for sure he'd be back in the morning, sifting sand between his fingers, his palms open to the sky, holding the sun, flipping it upside down, a coin raining the night to day to light again. We bet the lives of our dog and our two cats and our family photos blazing on top of the piano. We lit candles and poured full glasses of wine as red as red as coffees, waiting for Haydn's sonata in E minor open to the second movement to calm my fingers, to tap, 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 and find their way back to the music. We bet his return with a vengeance, a candle in one hand, a baker's bowl in the other, the back door slamming, the song of the sparrow slipping through the crack, pale and long. That space, that shimmer of light between his world and ours, grasping the edge of truth, was said, was implied by spring's arrival. Late, and later that year, the next, and the house burning gently, so gently, above the smoke and the flames, his name calling her name and ours bring back, back, back. Henry, forgive us our trespasses. So I have a picture of Henry that I found years later. I always said I felt as I was being watched. There he is in my picture of me in the kitchen. It's a good part of theater. <laughs> um, I'll move on. I'll read a little bit from my book, Cat Among the Tigers. I am not a cat. 
there's always a, a mix-up on that. Um, I don't know how many times people come up to me and say, oh, hi, Kat. No, Kat refers to, it's one of the names, Catherine Manson, who was a modernist writer, gave to herself. She gave herself many, many names. Um, and she saw herself in many selves. Um, Cat Among the Tigers is also came from a quotation of one of the letters and journal entries that I read from her. She said, I feel out of fashion. I feel like a cat among the tigers. So I just sort of changed it to cat. Anyway, um, so this book, um, as, a, as Brenda said, based on the journals and uh, letters of Catherine Mansfield, it shows us a wide range of Catherine. Um, her life was like Hollywood. Uh, somebody should make a film on. Um, she ran away with the circus. She fell in love with these twins. She got impregnated and then she tried to marry the other twin. She would make, realize you could make money if you bend down low on the piano. Um, that, those were some of her early days um, when she was still thinking of being a cellist. So when I began this book, I wrote it as fugues, as if she were still playing the cello, which she ended up selling and, of course, becoming a writer. Um, also in this book, you can see the transition from uh, poetry, which she thought she wanted to be a poet, into prose. And that's the middle section, which I, I never read because it's absolutely impossible to read. Uh, but I'm, so I'm going to give you uh, a, uh, a little bit of a range. I'm going to read some poems here that I often don't, just, and I'll tell you in a minute um, why. I don't think these particular poems. Um, so the other thing that, that I should say is that Catherine Mansfield um, died quite tragically early. She had TB, so she died in 1923. And the book begins in 1923 and it circles all over the places she's remembering different people, different places. She goes to many, many places, of course, looking for a cure. There, there wasn't a cure. Um, she ends up finally where she dies, just outside of Paris. Uh, in Fontainebleau, which I went to visit the grave there. And uh, it was kind of an artistic, an artistic ending. Uh, colorful. <laughs> so, um, this one I'm going to take you to her one and only home with her husband, John Middleton Murray, who was a critic, who, did, who has not weathered well over time, but he was very big during his time. So those early modernism times. He was he was uh, quite well known. And the one house that they had, they named it the elephant because it was a big gray house. So I'm going to go back to their home in 1918, June of 1918. Um, there's a reference here that when I talk about purple lips, that's a reference to influenza in 1918. Which is a topic that I'm currently working on now in a longer book in the of one fiction. Um, the other thing that adds a little bit, doesn't really matter, is uh, Bogey was the name that she gives to John. So this is called All That Is Silent. It's just about life. When the coffee is cold, things happen. Life feasts upon the unpretentious, asleep, awake. The loves and the bed bugs suck my blood, yours. Together the we, us, hook and worm our way through your reluctant heart. Yet nothing seems incurable in the afternoon but the sky infinite and alone, or the sea crying, bogey, bogey. Rushing head first into rock, without the feeling, thinking, sense. Where shore meets water, and the waves so very tired, sleep for a moment, dream on rock. Then turning round, swim back again. The sea sends songs through my bones. I do not always hear them. What is here today, tomorrow, wears thin. I can tell where you stood on the carpet. I know where you pace about the room. I'm rather like the lily bent.
bending and arrays, my neck broken, color fading fast. I sense life, feel it here and here. Each needle pricks the will to wake, to sleep again, to dream. It's true, I walk a little less. I scuttle across the sand and leaning on a stick. All that is silent, all that is true, all that you. Pinpricks of the earth might be a way of speaking worm, to wiggle past the difficult, to climb back into sand. All along I have known this scratching itch, this needling jaw unlocked. There's no speak of love, although I felt it crawling, creeping up the neck, a wave of sure certainty, a dream. It's true. I forge on hope. I hook and warm while it performs its little trick. Then I stand a little straighter. Then I lean less on the stick and prowl about the seashore, calling out to you. The sea might sing more, more beautifully, might get the center note. Tell me everything. Everything more is silent. Everything more is true. Bogey, the coffee's cold. Things happen. novels 
and a really well thumbed copy of C.H. Lawrence's collected poems. So I thought I would read a couple of poems, um, at least one, in the way of time, um, dedicated to the H. Lawrence, who was a very good friend of Catherine Mansfield's for some time. And they had much in common. Um, I believe that, that Lawrence, who had to be, he, he, he may have been a carrier too, because there seems to be a lot of people that were around him also had TV. So he had TV before Catherine had TV, but he died years later, um, much later after her. However, she began to notice things about D.H. Lawrence as she saw in her own self, from the same symptoms, shifting moods, fevers. So this one, um, also bringing back to the elephant, this is September 1918 as well. Um, so I dedicate this one to you her friend, D.H. Lawrence. We are unspeakably alike, you and I. Our black moods, our pinching eyes, how we see the room off color, the chairs too big, too small, to sit quietly. My arm stiff, unused to writing, reaches for the pen. Stutters and coughs, unfinished sentences prick the throat in this place that steals my senses this place where ghosts refuse to live. The fire noisy flaps like a flag or a fish hooked pulling the line too quickly, chokes, sputters for breath, denies, denies, heaven glowing above our heads. This black mood pulls and tugs as if it can't decide if night is something to run to or from, the pen, the knife, the cold touch of your hand. Love's anesthesia creeps between the cracks of words. Your letter stains my fingers when I read it. Ink spots my palms, disrupts lines. I live by my thumb and my index finger, pinching the sun's reflection, pins, needles. What goes in must come out broken on the carpet, unfinished sentences, ragged and ravished, as if, as if, I were Elliot's crab scuttling across the sand. Before the window, fields of flies beat their transparent wings. Quite the impossible music of days spent, alive, asleep, awake. I dream its music makes much of my chest. Time stutters. The story grows too big for my mouth, denies, denies this place full of ghosts. We are unspeakably alike, you and I, buzzing unannounced, a flurry of papers, pages turning, thumbs, fingers, famous for a fit of orange, yellow, a blade of blue, a pen scratching, snuffs out the light, the ceiling, the floor, the chair, where I haven't moved. Love's anesthesia burns in the window, sneaks in after dark, pulls and tugs, as if I can't decide which sentence to finish, which thought to follow your cold hand, to reel in the line, to tell you again and again, though we are so terribly alike. I don't read that one very often. And 
the relentless conversations where everything was sex, sex, sex. And of course, if you read his, I'm thinking particularly if you've read his book, The Rainbow, everything is sex, 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 climax, climax, climax. <laughs> so this is about Catherine uh, pondering and spending so much time with Lawrence that she, I, I think she was just, she and John sort of scuttled out one night and that was it. She just couldn't take it anymore. So this is called, uh, I'm just going to do something I have only done once in my life as well. I woke up one morning and I was old. Uh, she, however, is older than me. So, um, I just might be a little easier here for me. Okay, it's called, This Master, This Mistress. Who wants to live like grown up people lost in a world of sex? Gorse curse among the gray rocks, bluebells bicker, violets done with dialogue endlessly argue the same conclusion. And all the while the wind whines, and all the while he sows sex into sad corners of a witless room. Walls shake the mouth, suckling the seam of some imagined breast. Oh, love looks good in a pretty hat, tastes a pretty tea. And all the while he raves and roars, and all the while he beats his fists, adders curl around his legs, Cupid smokes the fag, and morning gives itself to afternoon, dark full of cloud, its ebony rain streams down the window, rivers of hate. How I hate this master, this mistress, pushing each to each. I'd rather die in the middle of a laugh, or scrabbling into bed, wink my toes before the fire, then hear more of intercourse worming through the heart. Just now the wind stops speaking. Just now violets in a frenzy spatter, natter, begin to talk of tea and trimming hats. Rocks spit obscenities upon the suckling sea, find the shore's withered breast, now each to each sex recalls an endless end of wrong. I'd rather da die laughing, bound for bed, scrabble in my pajamas, weep my toes in stone, than live among the grown-ups bitching sex, sucking Cupid's stupid fag, or sniffing tired posies, tied with pretty ribbon, bound with pretty string. The needle darns a pair of trousers, stitches rings around the sun. Who sets his morning? Who coils the wind? Fever breaking, breaks, begins again. This master, this mistress who wants to live, who wants to live grown up, sin to sin? Charlie, also of course Charlie Chaplin, who 
which is why she named that Charlie. Um, I think that's for all of them. Um, oh, and the, and the albatross is Ida. She was sick to death with the companion Ida, um, who was only trying to look after her, of course, but she just, by this time she's very, very ill. Um, she's had, uh, her lung has, one of her lungs has uh, hemorrhage, and she's, so she's, you know, she's just approaching early 30s, and she's, she's as I say, you probably noticed I was talking about sticks. She's walking with a cane, she's so well. She's very, very ill. So this is pantomime of the sea in picture of southern Italy. Stuck on the border of the sea, I brush sand with bound twigs and drag my albatross over the shore. Swoosh, swoosh, silence hissing in my chest. The bird struggles for its last breath, shakes its legs thin, unfolds its wing to mark its final spot, for death comes slowly, unannounced, here and here. When I'm sure no one is looking, when I'm quite alone, I haul its great body over rocks and heaps of sand and lift my hat to Charlie in this pantomime of the sea. In this pantomime of the sea, the black smudge of my cape Lots to hum, the rise and fall, water marking the spot where life moves, claws the edge of the horizon, crawls from a burlap bag. Stuck on the borders of the shore, I have no intention of drowning, no thoughts of holding my hissing breath to breath, head full of, full of water, buried beneath sand. Memory shifts my gaze from room to room, day, night, the hourglass flutters its eye. The afternoon whispers, weighs on the back of shoulders, presses cold against the door, and rising to the ceiling, a rainbow, yellow, blue, red, drowns the strange green light. I've made a life of matchsticks, made light of shadows, so I have no intention of drowning, sorting life grain by grain, to find the hum of rooms unchanged, my black cape yawning, my pen unmoved. All the while I think of you, she, me, someone else, there's the perfect gesture creeping upon the shore, lifting one's hat to an unmoldy sun, greeting the mountain's blinking eye, when no one is looking when no one is looking, when I'm quite sure I'm alone shaking this threadbare night, pen dragging its quill across the page, one-legged smudges the story, marks the spot where my great bird spreads its wings, unannounced, moment by moment, tipping my hat to a sink full of smoldering cigarettes, matchsticks burning room to room, dark, then light, this spot on the lung is terrible, and all the time, all the time, I think of you. I am going to leave Catherine behind. And how much time do I have, Brenda? Oh, one, one more poem. One more yeah. Okay. I'll give you the. Um, um, I just finished a manuscript on. Uh, H.D. Hilda Doolittle, um, another modernist writer. Um, I was attracted to her because of her sessions with Freud, and so this collection I've just finished traces her sessions psychoanalysis, which was fairly new uh, in the 1930s. She visits Freud in Vienna in two different sessions, in 1933 and 1934. Uh, so I'm basing my poems on, on uh, those sessions where Freud told her, do not speak of this, do not talk about your sessions, do not analyze these sessions or you'll ruin them. And so the first thing she did was she wrote to her companion uh, for two weeks until she was told not to do this anymore. And, um, and it was her companion, Breyer, who was a very, very wealthy woman, who 
paid for these sessions, which were outrageous. So they were for the wealthy only. Uh, I think they still are, but <laughs> back then they were very expensive. So um, in this one, I'm imagining her in Freud's waiting room. And if you go to the website, you can actually see what Freud's waiting room looked like. They had a museum for Freud in Vienna. Uh, so this one is is uh, HD. So HD talking to Freud. That's going to be other voices here, and mixing up all kinds of memories. This is called. It's, it was supposed to be spring when I saw the Griffin. It was supposed to be spring when I saw the Griffin. Yet. His wings full of snow sagged with the weight of winter, and his feet kicked in ice, froze the daily news to something solid between his chops. <coughs> April would remain April. Wednesday would be that Wednesday blossoms would not bloom. The war continued. You could hear bullets rushing through wind, and the griffin, the poor bird starved, took a bite of apple I was eating and lit the sky red. Then, the world on fire. I wanted to return to winter to that bird and its cold news. But instead, reclining on the couch, my hands dangling over the furniture, I stirred the flames of desire. I stroked plumes of smoke. Yuffie came trotting into the room and licked my salty palms, first one, then the other, then a look from Rex sent the poor chow to his master's side. Afterwards, I drank white wine from the Holy Grail and ate apples at the vine of the inn. I sat outside crying for lilacs and was embarrassed for myself. <coughs> there was blood on my pillow. It was August, and the sun high on light and air turned the myth I was dreaming. And again, it was spring. Wasn't it? Fido's papa thumped miles away, his whiskers flicked with light, his fur jumped with fleas, and his paws frantically scratching air, an impossible itch, itch. It was an impossible war, a lovely dog. Then I believed I could burn that burning candle by the bed and dream, bruising the skin beneath my eye, purple and sleepless, Shades of winter circled above. It was dark. I don't remember. Dangling my hands over the rim, my wine glass hummed as I swallowed a bite of apple. Sirens sang in the streets, yet I did not learn to join them, and instead bowed my head to Griffin's fantastic thrashing. Beating the air senseless, the war might have ended then, on that last hit, on that flat note. There was blood on my pillow when I woke. Someone had lit the candle by my bed. I could smell wax and imagine the tiny trail of smoke swimming toward the light. The myth turned. Lilacs, reluctant to open, stood against the light, stoned the sun to sleep, opening their eyes. Branches punched air, and the winter had gone, the ice broken, and the war. The griffin held the daily news frozen in its chops. It was winter. It was cold. A spot of blood stained my pillow. Thank you for listening.
And Calvin was feeding him glasses of wine. He said he's a maritime or he's not. <laughs> We've got to keep him <laughs> lubricated. So I'd always be grateful for that, John. I'm very happy he comes. The first time he's made it to a poetry salon, he's usually working. I've been working, yes. Yeah, so welcome, John. In an isolated world at sea, I am untouchable. Free on a motion that starts nowhere and ends nowhere. In full splendor expressed to this tiny virtue of freedom, expands to the outpost of my daytime dreaming, fully alive in the blistering exports of gratuity to all. And then suddenly seized by a moment's apparition, Venture into this divinely desert land routinely avoided. Step into soil between my toes, and all around breathe stark, fresh, filled air. Hearing the sound of my own voice reaching out to touch and make contact. The moment kept in hand is only a dream unfulfilled, waiting for release, allowing that dream its own choices in coming to life beyond. As so many thoughts echo into such dreams, set for release from the hand that chooses to.
and participated in what, what they call a thousand and one nights of storytelling every Friday evening, still going strong down at UFT. I know what other books down there. Uh, and Brenda has just given me the intro uh, to say something here. One of, our, one of our audience members is also a member of a thousand and one nights, and I would strongly recommend it on a Friday evening for entertainment. But different to what you see in here. And if they caught me doing what I'm about to do, they would throw me in Lake Ontario. That's what they guarantee I'm about to read it for you. Okay, so bring it with you. Okay, from you, I'm going to really pour the hell out of all these guys. Um, I, have, I have okay. to say it a, a thousand and one story nights. It's past the talking stick and there's no reading. It's traditional. It's the traditional form of storytelling. Yes. Where they have a specialized stick. Yes. Don't ask me what that means. But they have a stick and one telegrams up and he takes the stick from the previous teller and occupies, takes the stage for the duration of the tell. However, right now, I'd like to take you on back about 25 years to the night that I almost took the stick myself in a completely different context. I was laid off from industry and suffered a lot of pain and trauma by consequence. I was laid off from the night shift and the following night with no job to go to, I was at home. I got up, sleepwalked at 4 o'clock in the morning, tried to get through my bedroom door with a little thing in which I don't recommend. It can be a very painful experience, but it woke me up. And in the process, I wrote this. It's all over. Three years of toil and labor and a noisy, dusty production line, and now it's all over. And all because of a piece of paper. The United Workers Union list of names with my name. Right up there at the top, the big layoff has finally come. It's all over. And those of you just running on right trip, will you please follow me? And we all followed him that first training day, and he served us coffee and tea. And they not really into those rookies as to how they like things to be, the do's and don'ts of quality control, the rights and wrongs of our newfound role as employees, not staff members, but employees of the world's biggest manufacturing company. Now it's all over. Uh, he was Victor. Victor the white shirt. Victor the blue tie. Victor the manager. Victor the boss. Victor in his private office. Victor standing on the line, watching, listening to all of us. Victor had come up from love. Victor had climbed his way to the top. Victor was a good part of the expression. Victor was king shit. Victor knew every job. But now it's all over. Uh, Harry, Victor pointed to me, would you please go with Katrina? And Katrina raised her hand. And I went off with Katrina to join her select band of the elite. The guys who made it happen on the night shift. Ah, Katrina. Katerina the Greek, who tested the dials on the faces of the plates, on the markings of the switches as they came down the line. One for me, one for you. She gave me a switch. She, she took a switch and gave me one. She then tested the knobs on the dial. Not too little, not too much. You see, easy job. An easy job. Night shift tester. But the all over. <laughs> then there was Jenny. Sexy little Jenny. The body of a fashion model. The face of a movie star. The voice of a heavenly angel. And a brain that could have taken her far. <clears throat> Jenny, Jenny, Jenny. Jenny, the packer who put switches on racks and racks into boxes 
and close the box and seal the box and name on the box and this time the box right. Close and leave it off. In into the loop for a quick smoke. But it's all over now. And how could I forget Pedro? Pedro. Who loved the girls and loved the money. But he did the work and loved the shirt. He brought humor to our life. But when he was suspended or disciplined, but never fired, things went slower. We all got bored. And then, hey guys, what's happening? What's happening? Bevel was back. We all were told. Now, today, it's all over. <coughs> so, Victor, Katarina, Jen, and Bevel. And poor old Sebastian Slowly dying of cancer, and good old Kathy, heart of gold, but looked like a witch. And Ed with his passion for sticks, and Sally the definitive witch. Christmas parties, birthday parties, union meetings, seminars, time cards, units per hour, safety books, safety classes, earplugs, cuts, and scratches. And now, the big layoff is all over. Where? Oh, where do I go? From here. I serve the moon, say nothing but the moon, say nothing but candle and sugar.
don't speak of pain. Save nothing but treasure. And if you know this not, suffer not. Say nothing. Dush, divan es adam. Es marodi dobrov amadam. Na gramasam, jam amada. Last night, I went insane. Love saw me and said, I have come. Don't howl. Don't tear your garments. Say nothing. I said, oh love, I fear the other who said, there is no other. Say nothing. من به گوشت تا سخن های نهان خواهم گفت سر در آن دکی بری جاست که به سر هیچ من I will whisper secrets into your ears not for yes say nothing but with a nod من غلام قمرم به سر در آن من غلام قمرم غیر قمر هیچ من پیش من جاست Welcome, 
met you at Q Space, Joni. Oh, I meant to bring that sketch of you. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm going to give it to you. Yeah, yeah, I've got that. Yeah. All oh, right. Yeah, I was doing fabulous timing until it started raining, just bam, right on the QBW one from flying down the road to pausing a lot. Yeah, and I was sitting here texting madly, where's Joni? Where's Joni? <laughs>
slide guitar on this little recording, which sounded awesome. And the bell for Nick.
around. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to do a song for a guy called... I think we'll do the little blues one. Lock the door, I guess. 
the sunshine out there, I am sure. So packing up my bags and running for the door, away from your destiny into my own.